today's going to be a little different. Um, I, uh, a lot of people have said, I didn't know you would be here. I'm not sure where I am, uh, to be honest with you. It's seven hours ahead. I don't know what that is. Three or four in the afternoon. <clears throat> got in on Friday uh, afternoon, evening, and um, God bless our youth pastor, planned a young adult get together at our house and barbecue on Friday night. Now, that was awesome to come back to. No, actually, it was really good because it forced me to stay awake um, <coughs> until I would have uh, much rather um, have gone to sleep. So that worked out good. So, uh, but yeah, just returned Friday night. And I, today would be a little different than normal uh, because this is such an important thing. I really want to share with you about our trip, and I'll tie it a little bit into our message, but, and you'll hear more about that in a second. But I do have a verse that we, I want us to kind of center ourselves around today um, that we will, we will uh, be looking at as we even go. So would you stand to your feet as we always do, just as we read God's Word? God's Word is different than anything else. It's, it's not um, some other human words or words that change, words that are good today, and <clears throat> we need some better ones in a few weeks. They are eternal truths to us. They guide us, they lead us, they strengthen, they empower us. And here's Jesus' some of his final words before leaving this earth, before going with his disciples. And he said to this, it's, it's oftentimes titled in your Bible, it's not in the scripture itself, but in the Bible it's titled the Great Commission, this, this great mission that Jesus gave the disciples at the end. Matthew 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And let's just pray before you're seated. Jesus, would you speak to us today? God, this command was given to your disciples in that moment, but it wasn't an isolated uh, uh, moment. It wasn't just for them. Uh, it got it, it's as if you're saying it to us today, and you are, that you are challenging us to go, Lord, in our lives, Lord, and fulfill the mission, the purpose that you have for each person here. There is nobody here without purpose, without a mission that they've been given. And so, Lord, we just listen for that. We receive it today. And Lord, may our hearts be open, Lord, to what you would uh, share with us and how you would lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My last kind of, go ahead and be seated, sorry. My last kind of political shirt, it's my favorite, it's not so political these days, but I thought it was funny. It says, feeling great about tomorrow. I love my Senate bros, <laughs> said Julius Caesar, sometime around March of 44 BC. <laughs> All right, just Google et tu brute and remember some Roman history as he was supposedly feeling good. He was stabbed in the back by his good friend in Senate. All right. Um, we hope that none of that happens. All right. So a little, little lighter t-shirt as we, we move closer and closer to this election. So, hey, by the way, um, I didn't put this in my notes, but um, thank you for praying um, as I'm going to be talking all about this, this group of Iranians in, in Turkey. We prayed that they would be allowed to come. And no kidding, the second group that arrived on Wednesday afternoon was in the air, in the plane, when they shut down Iranian airspace. And so they were allowed to land. And uh, it was funny. Uh, so they were allowed to be there. They were so excited. And Isan, as they arrived, said to them, we have been, Mark and his church have been praying for weeks that there would be no problems, and you're here. And, you know, they clapped, and they were excited. And he said, the problem was, though, we never thought to tell the church to pray for you to also get home. Uh, we only prayed for you to get here. And it was amazing to me because, I don't know, I, I'm... I'm pretty much go with the flow if you know me, probably too go with the flow for some of you and others would like it, but I'm not, I don't get, I don't get too, too, uh, I don't know, sh uh, razzled by too much. But I was curious that they got there and there was no way to get back and no one said anything. They didn't talk about it because I'm like, how are you guys getting home? Like when are you getting home? And, uh, and apparently they're supposed to be, be flying home today. I will get confirmation from Isan. Uh, modern day warfare as we, we project. Maybe there's good things about that. Countries say what they're going to do before they do it. And, um, but hey, we prayed and they were able to be there. And so that was, that was awesome. That was huge. Um, so, and I want to say one more thing too. I, maybe it was just the way that we talked about it and had people pray. Maybe it's because it's the country of Turkey and a lot of us are unfamiliar with that country. I know my mom was checking in on me a lot. Uh, she was worried about me. And I'm like, Mom, I'm fine. I've been to Turkey once before. I mean, I, I really actually have enjoyed my time there. Um, but she 
felt better once I was, once I was home, but um, I really felt, not, not, not joking, like so many texts, so many emails, even phone calls from so many of you, even during the week just saying, hey, I'm praying for you, I hope it's going well. I really felt, I, I always feel supported by you as a church, but I, I actually, I really felt sent like a, like a missionary there. It was, it, was a, it was a neat feeling, and I know they received it as that, and so thank you um, for that. I, I really, really, really appreciated that, just knowing that um, it wasn't just that you were praying for my safety, but you were praying for what was happening there and what is taking place, and it really, really is incredible, and I, I just been praying since, since the last couple of days of going home, just asking the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to make plans, but Lord, how do, we, how do we continue to stay connected? The Lord has just given, if you, if you go out with me or go out to coffee with me and you ask me questions, you're going to hear, my wife is almost tired of hearing about it, but I'm like, honey, I, I can't explain it, but the Lord's just given me a heart for Persians, which are, um, before they would be known as Iranians, that's kind of the area of, of, of the ancient country of Persia, and they call themselves Persians, uh, and because um, they sometimes they speak different languages, but God's just given me a heart for them. I, I'm, I just been been praying and thinking about them, and I just love them, and uh, and I just, Lord, whatever you want to do, whatever is you do to connect connect our church to them, I pray that He just continues to do that. So, let me give you, a, we've, we've never before in the 18 years that I've been here have ever given to one project um, more than you guys gave in just four four or five short weeks uh, last year to do these DLTs in Iran. So I felt like it was, it's really worthy of, I will have a message that connects to this, but I thought it was worthy to give the time to it today because you are deeply invested there. Over $90,000 you gave uh, last December, blowing me away. I, I thought we might be able to reach 45,000, which would have done three DLTs for one of the two groups that Isan is working with. Uh, but you gave over 90,000, which allowed them to do both groups um, three times this year and, and know that most, most Iranians don't have much money. Even the first group had a few people that we would say have good jobs like doctors and some professors, um, but most of them, um, their economy, things are not good in their country, as you probably are aware, uh, and they just don't have the things that we have. In fact, I asked um, a young couple, you'll meet them here in a moment, I said, hey, do you guys want more kids? They had one little boy who's three years old, and they were like, yes, uh, but we can't afford it. And then I started noticing every single family there but one, because I think they had twins, only had one child. And uh, they all have a heart. I mean, they, they're just kind of their culture and their families of having families and having big families, but they, they just they don't think about having more than one child because you, you just can't afford it. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the ladies who's a cab driver there who um, leads a, like a, a, an underground group in northern Iran, um, she, uh, she, she, she's a cab driver. She's excited to come to these DLTs because they get to eat a lot of meat all week long because uh, that's not something that they're able to afford all the time. And so she was just excited to, to be able to have three really solid meals a day. And so it's just, just know that that's where the money went because these people could not afford flights. They could not afford the hotel room. Um, they couldn't afford this travel. And so that, those funds went to help make it possible for them to go. So um, DLT is, don't worry, I've got lots of pictures, you know, I'll keep it interesting. But DLT stands for Discipleship Leadership training. It's something that Foursquare has created, um, I don't know, a decade or two ago, and have really finalized it in the last 10 years or so uh, with, with professors and theologians and pastors in the Foursquare denomination. And they, it is good discipleship material that you could use in your church, um, but I think they specifically made it with the thought that it could be contextualized uh, in missions for countries anywhere around the world to help people get the basics. And that's what these, these sweet, sweet people needed was just the basics because they don't have what you and I have. Um, most of them went back home, and I just felt for them, are going back home to being virtually alone because most of them attend church online because there's no church. Uh, and so they, they watch it uh, like we do maybe when we're not feeling well or we're busy over the weekend, but that's all they have. So you can imagine never having people around you in your life that, that encourage you, that know what it's like to follow Jesus, that know n- n- nobody physically. And so this was like, this is like the highlight of, of their year, uh, uh, of their life, it seems. And so we did, we did two DLTs. It was in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, just a couple quick pictures. If you don't know Istanbul, this is only one direction. Isan took me up to a place to grab coffee to, to, to look out over the whole city. It's 18 million people. It's, it's one of, you know, the top 
largest cities in the world. It's unbelievable. It's huge. Um, but they did one in Istanbul, one DLT in Ankara, and then one in a city named Van, which is in western Turkey, right on the border of um, Iran. This one worked out good because it's easy for me or anybody to get to Istanbul. All right, you can go ahead and go to the next slide there. Um, this was the first group uh, that was there. They got there Sunday night. I, I was still in transit, um, and so I got to meet them on Monday. Um, this man here is named Paymon. He is um, um, an Iranian who now lives in Ankara and um, had migrated to Turkey, as many of them have, and um, went to Isan's church. I'll show you Isan in a moment. Went to Isan's church, started growing the Lord, and Isan said, you need to start your own congregation um, that, that speaks Farsi, which is what most of them um, speak still from being in Iran. And so he he leads the church there. Uh, it's not a huge church in our minds, but it's a pretty big church there. It's probably about 40 to 50 um, that regularly attend, and it's almost all Iranians. But what is amazing, oh man, I cry a lot now. I don't know if I'm losing testosterone at 47 or uh, if I just lo love these people, but I mean, so many of them just get lost, and they found him. These, fo these folks, very few of them live in Turkey. Most of them are in Iran. Oh, there's Isan. I didn't see him. Um, they, they find him on Instagram because they're depressed, because they feel hopeless, and um, they start a conversation, and he's using Instagram in an amazing ways uh, to get into Iran. In fact, I was laughing with all of them because the, one of the bane of my existence right now, I'll give you a little insight into Chester household, is uh, if, you, if you have young, young teenagers, you hopefully are, know what a VPN is. Uh, if you don't, that's because you're probably older, you don't have kids, and you don't need to worry about it. But young kids know what VPNs are because the schools are constantly trying to track down on VPNs here because VPNs are a virtual private network where you log in from anywhere and you can get around firewalls. So you can play video games and access Facebook and TikTok while you're at school. And it's a constant battle to stay on top of VPNs. Well, and I hate them because my son gets distracted with YouTube and video games because he gets on VPNs and I'm trying to keep him focused on school. But I found out that VPNs, though, are being used by God <laughs> because countries like Iran and Korea and many others that shut down uh, parts of the internet in their countries can't stop VPNs either. I'm like, well, thank God. I came home and told Nathan, gave him a hug, and I'm like, you know what? I can't stand that VPN, but I'm thanking Jesus for it in one aspect um, because they can get around and they can now watch church. Um, they can get connected because it looks like, or, you know, they're just going around a, a, a network spot in Iran and logging in through Germany or logging in through the United States. So actually VPNs are huge right now in spreading the gospel um, and allowing that to happen. So um, anyway, that's how a lot of people have gotten connected and finding um, um, looking through Instagram searches of Farsi and finding the church, they get connected, and then they end up here. Go ahead and go to the next one. This is the second group. Um, this group is uh, mostly in, so the previous, the previous group, a lot of them were in Tehran or near Tehran, which is kind of north central in, in, <clears throat> in Iran, but uh, western side of Iran goes further up, and that's where this group is from, there and Azerbaijan. I'll be honest with you, I only knew Azerbaijan was a country because I seen a couple of them in the Olympics, uh, but I, I could not have told you, how's your Middle East geography? We're going to work on that today. Um, and so a lot of them are from the border there of Azerbaijan or just south in Iran, which actually was Azerbaijan at one point. There's been a lot of disputes over border lands, as you can imagine, in that area. And so that's the second group, wonderful people, a little different, um, 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 and just meaning that they're just different groups of people. The, this group is, is Iranians, but their, their background is less Persian and more um, with Azerbaijan or even Turkey, though they speak Farsi and they speak Iranian because uh, they, they live there. So those are the two groups. And again, all this made possible by you. Most of them come as single people from an area in Iran by themselves. And this is like, like the biggest group of Christians, uh, Iranians they've ever been around. And it's really incredible. So um, we did teaching every day from about 9.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, oh, let's start here first real quick. So this is Isan. Um, he is the president of Foursquare Turkey, and uh, he's been here several times, developed a relationship with him in 2007, can't believe it, 17 years ago. I met him on a bus, uh, a tour bus in Israel, and, um, and he, he would tell you, you guys, this church um, has been such a blessing to him because he was, he was struggling. They, uh, if you look it up in 2006, I think it was, or seven, um, there were several um, uh, Turkish 
people that were killed and missionaries were martyred uh, in Turkey for their faith, and he was close to all of them because back then, um, even, even still, you know, there wasn't very many people that were Christians in Turkey, and so our church really came alongside and has supported him all these years and really deeply encouraged him. He's so grateful and thankful. Uh, and again, that's Paymon, and so Isan will be back here again next year. I said, Isan, you have to come back, um, so he's trying to work it out. And there's, there's my time. I taught both groups for about two, two and a half hours um, for each group, and um, it's challenging. This is Nagid. She was my interpreter. She's 23, speaks five languages. What are you doing with your life? I mean, that's what I asked her. I'm like, I'm like I, am, I am doing nothing with my life. And so, um, and she's learning a sixth Hebrew. I'm like, yeah, because you're bored. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was great. Um, she fled um, Iran after becoming a Christian as a teenager and lives in Turkey now with her mom and sister. I'll show you a picture of them in a moment. Um, but we just taught in this hotel room. Go to the next slide there. Um, no windows. They're down in the basement. I mean, it's legal to do this, but they don't like broadcast it. And you're talking 12, almost 12 hours a day, and they're just going as Isan lectures. I mean, most of us sleep when I hit 30 minutes here on Sunday morning, and I mean, no one sleep. I mean, they're so engaged because they never get this opportunity. They never get an opportunity to have someone teach them, to speak to them, and so it was just, it was, it was just really incredible. They do more than just the teaching at night. Um, they would do special services. I think it's the next slide here. Um, uh, they did communion. We don't think that's a big deal, but can imagine you never get to do communion with anybody else uh, except for yourself or if your family is a Christian, and so to be able to do it with others, which is really what communion is about, is this, this uh, joining together as the body of Christ. So it was so special to sit there and watch them take communion together. They worshiped. Um, go ahead and go into the next slide there. Um, we did baptisms, uh, but before we jump to the baptisms, this couple here, um, <clears throat> they live in kind of central Iran. Um, they, um, they got married as Muslims and has now, have now become Christians, and so they asked could we renew our vows, kind of redo our wedding ceremony under God? And it's so beautiful. And they're like, there's people here with us. Oh, go ahead and go back to the last slide there. Um, um, so beautiful as they renewed their vows. Their son here, because um, a good looking tall guy, um, they, uh, he was there to be with them. And they just said, listen, our, our marriage and our covenant now is so different um, because of knowing Jesus. And they wanted to celebrate with other, other people. And so then the dad... Uh, and the son got baptized in the pool, in the basement of this hotel, because they never, ever have a chance to be baptized, uh, because there's really, I mean, they could do it by themselves, but they first want a pastor to do it, and, um, and it's just not something they understand. So when they come to the DLTs, oftentimes they get baptized, even if they've been saved for a while. Um, many of them have for a couple years now. Go ahead and go to the next one there. Um, this is a, a young couple, um, Muhammad and Tina, um, by the way, it's good that you're in service today. Uh, we will keep this up online, but we will have to black out um, all the faces um, later. Most of these names are Christian names that have been given, so they're not real names. They're not last names. Muhammad's kind of a common name in the area, um, but um, we will have to black these out later, but it, they said it was okay to show you here on Sunday morning, and so um, uh, they're renewing their vows. They got married. His, his, his parents uh, they lived in London for a little while. I was born in Iran. They moved to London for about five or six years. They moved back to Iran, and his parents decided they'd rather live in London and left him in Iran as a young teenage boy. And so he was growing up in the streets on his own. Uh, he met Tina, and they got married uh, because they were just, and she was kind of had a, have an abandonment type story too with her family. And so they got married really young. She was 14 and he was 17. Um, she's now, I think, 19 or 20, and they have a three-and-a-half-year-old. Um, and so life has been really difficult for them. But he is so excited. He, I was going to show you a video. I uh, do that privately sometime. But he's so funny because he speaks with this English accent from some of the Middle East, but with a British accent. He is almost impossible to understand. But he can talk English, so he talked to me a lot. And I'm like, Muhammad, slow down. Muhammad, please say that word again. Uh, and, um, uh, but he was, he has texted me nonstop since I've gotten back. I am his father, uh, is a time, like a term of respect. He first called me daddy. I was like, I'm not daddy. And he goes, I, <laughs> he goes, I'll call you father. I'm like, better than grandfather. And, uh, and, um, 
And, uh, and he has no one, no one in his life. No, can you imagine? No mentor, no one, anyone other than the online church that they're a part of. And so they renewed their vows. Oh, it was so special. And he kept crying because he said, we got married. We had no family. We had no friends. Not only are we being married now under God, but we're being married now with other people celebrating. And they all started dancing when it was over. They've been saved. Um, he's been saved about a year and a half. His wife, about the same. His cousin, um, Marasa, she got saved three months ago. And and, um, and got invited to come, and so she was there, got baptized as well, and she was just a sponge, just growing, wanting to know more about Jesus. You can go ahead and next slide. Um, oh, there's, there's Marasa getting baptized, and Muhammad getting baptized, and his wife getting baptized. Oh, it was so special. So um, I'd, I'm going to forget here where I'm at. Go to the next one. Is it? Okay. And then um, Emmanuel, he got baptized as well. He was just such a I don't know. There's something about this guy that I just love. There's something in his eyes. I'm going to tell you something. Um, I'm not going to go into too many of their, their stories. I'll give you a couple in just a moment. But <clears throat> every single one of them, every single one of them from, from um, central Iran, uh, um, some of those that were in Azerbaijan were not the same, but every one of them had either tried to commit suicide or had heavily considered it when they came to know Jesus. And it was very sobering just to, to be reminded how, many, how much that people live with hopelessness uh, and they live with just a sense of, of having no purpose and, and thinking that life has just no meaning. And for them, Islam gives them none of that. They, they, not, not my words, but, but theirs, that they viewed God as a villain, as an angry like mobster who was just waiting for them to mess up so he could get them. And um, so when they came to know Jesus, uh, whether it's through a dream or through a miracle, um, this understanding of a God who made them in God's image, they don't believe that in Islam, that, that he, humans were made in God's image, um, and they, they start to understand that there's this God that cares about them and cares about creation and loves them, and it just transforms them. So Emmanuel was was really struggling. He was um, um, ready to attempt suicide and then met Jesus uh, several years ago now. And he is just, just the sweetest guy and has so much energy and excitement. I've never been kissed so much in my life other than my wife, uh, especially by men, but I got used to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just gotta, gotta roll with the punches there. So, um, so they did baptism, marriage renewal ceremonies. Uh, I told you a little bit about them. Oh, a couple more, a couple more here. Um, uh, here, here's a great example. Maram and F F F Fariba, um, uh, they're both in central Iran by themselves, traveled there by themselves, going back um, to Iran as believers, as women by themselves, attempting to share the gospel to help, help other people know Jesus, but all by themselves. I mean, your, your heart just goes out for them. It was just beautiful. I'm going to come back to Jacob or Jakob and Erasu. I really, really enjoy getting to know them. Um, they're currently living in Ankara, Turkey. And so, uh, do I have one more? Um, yeah, uh, and then this was this part of the second group. I just wanted to point out Eliar and Faxradin. That's a cool name. Uh, they, they live in Azerbaijan, uh, which is, this is uh, around here, and so Azerbaijan is just, just north of that. And um, they actually travel down into Iran once a month when they can afford it, um, lately, it's had to been uh, every other month. They haven't been able to afford it as much, um, but they go down and they oversee a hundred um, believe, underground believers in northern Iran, and they encourage them, they help them, they help disciple them, and they're just looking to start more home churches. Uh, they're amazing, both in their early 30s and, um, and, and devoted their life to this and give it full time. They actually are um, personally fully supported missionaries uh, from an organization to be able to do it full time. Um, they, so they they, they, they're funded themselves personally to be able to feed, you know, and care for their families. They just don't have, that doesn't come for their ministry of what they're trying to do in Iran. That's kind of on their own. And so I'm hoping that our church can continue to help Isan and, uh, and he can help them do more. They're not four square, but they're, they're, they do ministry with, with Isan all the time. And just wanted to show you them. They were, they're just such sweet and wonderful people. Um, he, he had another story, um, was, was a, uh, attempting to commit suicide side and then had a dream, had a vision of Jesus. His dad was in jail, didn't think his dad would ever make it out because he was transferred from jail from Azerbaijan to uh, northern Iran. Um, but after he got saved, his dad got saved, his dad was there, his mom got saved, uh, and, um, and now he's just in ministry and uh, it's 
It's, it's pretty incredible. In fact, um, I have uh, a couple videos I wanted to show you. They're real short, but they're just people saying thank you to you because they knew that you made all of this possible. And so um, watch these couple quick little clips. سلام می کنم خدمت برادر خواهران I live here in Turkey and I'm from Iran and I just wanted to thank you for uh, everything you've done for us. Thank you for letting God work through you for us. I just want you to know that we was we were so much blessed here with all your help. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> See you. Hello. Hello, God bless you. We'll all be together. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, said, I did the wrong video, the first one there. I'll get that fixed for next service. We had to switch the videos. Um, oh, man, I told you, my heart. Um, I'm so thankful for what God's doing. I wanted you to know, Pastor Isan, really quick, um, um, if you haven't met him before, um, like I said, we've been supporting him for many years. Go ahead and go to the next slide here. This is a, a map of the Middle East. And um, he's in Turkey. Istanbul is right here on this little strait on the Black Sea. And... Um, uh, he's in Turkey, and when he got saved in the late 70s, early 80s, um, there was less than 200 Christians in Turkey. And there's now nearing 10, uh, well, 5 to 10,000. They're not exactly sure. Um, they're planting churches all over the place. It's just incredible. Now, it's not... It's not something like, you know, we would think in, a, in, a, in, a, in our culture with that many people going to church, but for them, uh, Foursquare Turkey grows on average 10% a year. Uh, and I wanted to show you something because this speaks to a little bit our church supports. Isan, you can support him if you want yourself personally. Um, always, not, it doesn't go to him personally, but it goes to Foursquare Turkey. And if you give to Isan to to the denomination in Turkey. Let me, let me just show you what he's been up to the last 10 to 15 years. Um, this is a list of places they now have churches that did not have churches. He's working with a church in now Syria, an underground church in northern Syria, in Georgia, in Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, over here, has three. North Macedonia, which is kind of in this particular area here, um, borders Greece and a few other countries, uh, Kosovo and those. Uh, they now have churches in all those. And he's also developing leaders, like that didn't even count with all those that we just saw in Iran. Uh, he's developing leaders t and, and underground um, home, home groups and things like that in Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Bulgaria, and Moldova. I mean, it is just amazing. While I was there for what, three and a half, four days, Isan had dinner with an Arabic pastor, a Kurdish pastor, a Syrian pastor, a Turkish pastor, and, oh, there was two more. I can't remember right now. I, I, I just look at his life, and he, God is just using him in an apostolic way, and I, I just, I think it's just, a, I think it's amazing that our church can be a part of that. So, I, I, I say all that because I really wanted to report on the trip, but I also wanted you to know some of what, when you give, where it goes, and what it's doing, and, and it, it is, it's amazing how God is moving um, around the world right now, and just even in the reach of Turkey. Our, our church is going to stay deeply invested here, and man, if you feel like you have a heart for this, um, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to. We're doing okay on time, but like Kazakhstan, there, God is doing some great things there that Steve and Kim Cecil, who've been here a couple times this last year, are working with Kazakhstan. We're hoping to send some young adults there maybe later this summer um, for a youth conference, and then having an ongoing work with young adult ministry that's taking place in Kazakhstan. Um, um, Nagin who I'll come back to in a minute, um, who is my interpreter. She, they do now a, um, a summer camp for young adults in Turkey. They have 500 coming. I was like, 500? Just young adults? 18 to 25. 
unbelievable um, how God is moving. And so, boy, it's, it's just exciting to be able to be a part of it. So thank you again um, for giving to them, for supporting them, for loving them, for uh, sending me and allowing me to be a part of that. And I hope that not only myself, but many others of you are able to, to join us on future trips. They all have invited me to Iran, <laughs> um, but that's not happening, said my mom and my wife. <laughs> um, actually, I'd be, I, would, I would be up for going, but it's not, um, you're, it's, you can be allowed to go, but someone like me, someone like you probably could go. I don't know if you would want to, but someone like me who has an online presence as a pastor is a no-go um, um, to Iran. But you're allowed to go there, but you don't want to have a, an online presence um, connected to, to ministry. So, all right, let me, let me wrap this all up. I'll come back to a couple other testimonies too, and we'll pull it all together. But we've been talking about Jesus before politics, Jesus before politics. And wh- what I want us to just look at today was that passage that we looked at in Matthew, because that's what they called the Great Commission. And w- you can't help but think about, and I'd planned on talking about this months, a, m- a month or two ago when I planned the sermon series out, knew I would be in Turkey, is to me, this is the, kind of the, the culmination for me as we've been talking about Jesus before politics, because there is a great commission. There is a purpose that God has given each of us in our life if we are followers of Jesus. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, God has purposes and plans for you, but you have to decide whether you want to actually go and fulfill those things. So it's not like God has them for some that follow him and not for others. Everyone's been given a purpose and a plan, a mission from God. It's just that when you begin to follow Jesus, you're saying yes to his mission for your life, his plan for your life. So those of us that are following Jesus, there's, there's a mission. And to me, the great commission precedes all other missions and values that I have for my life, personally, but also, if you will, nationalistically, as we'll look at here in a moment, as the, as the, the disciples were thinking as Jesus was resurrected, and now what God was going to do for the nation of Israel, Jesus was correcting them to say, no, 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 there's, there's something greater than that, and he just got done giving them this great commission, which is, which is, it's not that, that none of those other things are important. This is just the preeminent. This is just the, the priority that, that comes before all that. My personal mission, my, my earthly citizenships, and so no matter what takes place in this election or in the next 50 that happen in the United States, or maybe we won't live, most of us won't live to see 50 elections, but the next 10, let's say, if we live that long, um, that, that there's something that's happening in our country, and as U.S. citizens and as people that follow Jesus that live in America, we're we're connected to that, and I think we should be a part of what happens in our nation. I think that's great. But before we ever get there, the Great Commission doesn't come after those things. It comes before all those things. And so let me just um, say this to you is what I, I mentioned a moment ago. In Acts 1, verse 6, the, the Jesus died and now was resurrected. He was getting ready to now ascend. Um, so he's, he's alive and he's walking the earth, but now he's getting ready to ascend. And he's telling his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And so they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom to Israel. And I've talked a lot about this. Hopefully there's a little bit of history and understanding now, but they were waiting to become a nation again. And it had been like seven, I think, seven nations that had come since David and Solomon had been king of a nation of Israel. And then they were conquered first by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the Persians and then the Greeks and then the, the Telemics, one of the generals of the Greeks, and then the, the Romans. And so they were waiting. They were just hoping that they would become a nation again. And so they're thinking, now that Jesus rose from the dead, this is what he's going to do. He's going to become a king like David, and he's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what I want you to catch here, and we're not, we're not just you know, jumping on the disciples' backs here because they continually made mistakes. We do too, but we can learn from them. We can learn from them, uh, their mistakes that they made. And so look at, look at what they say. Hey, Jesus, this is great. You died, you rose again, you're walking through walls. We can use this. Like, this is going to work. Like, we're going to be able to take over Rome. Things are happening. And, they, and in their minds, their paradigm never left Jerusalem and their pre, the previous nation of Israel. And so they said, are you going to now restore the kingdom to Israel? There's, it's wrong on a couple levels. Number one, that the kingdom was the nation of Israel, 
Uh, no, they had a nation of Israel that God wanted to use to tell the world about God. And to, take, and, and to make the whole world come to a place where they would acknowledge God. The kingdom was never just about Israel. But in their minds, that's what the kingdom was. And it was Israel, and it was here, and in this place, and it was for us. And again, I don't think we should blame them because they're just being human. It's just human to kind of think small, to think inward, to think national, to think self-focused. Where Jesus was like, no, oh, oh, oh hold on. Got a much bigger plan than that right? And you notice, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, no, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. What? And you're going to become an amazing like nation right here off the Mediterranean again? No, you're going to be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, yep, Judea, those are areas right there in the nation of Israel. But then Samaria, their, their neighbor right to the north, who they did not like, and to the ends of the earth. I mean, Jesus completely turns it inside out, what they saw as kind of small and narrow and kind of about their country, Jesus is like, whoa, no, 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 no. All this happened so that you will go to the ends of the earth. This is so much bigger than just one nation. This is about the whole world. And this is about you now being empowered to go to the whole world. And Jesus is basically re reiterating what he had already told them in Matthew 28. I want you to go and make disciples of the whole world. And so I'm going I'm to come back just to Two real quick, real quick stories because they're they're fun and amazing. Nagid here's was my interpreter, and um, she had fled from Iran with her mom. This is her mom. This is her her um, grandmother's sister. So a great aunt, um, and then her sister. And so they're all now living in Ankara. She goes to the church and helps with things like this uh, in all different ways with Isan, with things that he does. But Nagid, her testimony, the reason I share her is it was so similar to everyone else's. She said she was about in high school and she just began to question life. What is my purpose? What, what am I here for? And, and again, in her words and everyone else that spoke, I was kind of interesting to hear the, the similarities of just that, that I had these questions and they would learn about Islam and learn Arabic in, I think, ninth and 10th grade in school so that they could um, become followers of, of Islam. And so she said, I just started asking these questions to my teachers. Well, what, 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 I don't understand why God made us and, and, and what we're here for. And she was told, as many of them were, to shut up and not ask those questions. They're disrespectful. And, uh, and so she just started wrestling with, I just don't understand what the meaning of life is and, 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 and how you know, how God created the world, but why He created the world, and why He created me. And she got to the point where she was suicidal, and was starting to think about how she could take her own life. And one night before, or one night when she went to bed, she had this dream of a sheep. And that's a kind of funny story. You heard Muhammad there in the video a minute ago, right? Hello, everyone. Like, it's kind of hard to understand. He told me, he was interpreting when she gave her testimony, and he said she saw a ship. Well, a ship is a sheep, but it sounds like a ship. And, uh, and so I thought she said that she was like a vessel uh, under a tree. It was really hard to understand. But anyway, I found out it was a sheep. And, uh, and so she saw sheep on a hillside under a tree. And it was a really bright day. And there was a sun, sun that was in, uh, over, the, over the mountains. And this man walked up. She had no idea who he was. And he picked up the sheep, can you imagine, put him on his shoulders, and he walked to the sun. And she had no idea who this person was, but she just knew that he was good. And, uh, and, and then she woke up, and she just thought that was weird. She asked her grandmother, uh, her sister, about the dream and said, what does that mean? And her grandmother said, you ate too much some Turkish, uh, some Turkish food the night before, or Iranian food the night before, and said, don't even think about it. So she kind of forgot about it. And it was several months later that Paimon, remember the pastor of the, the Iranian church in Ankara, that's her uncle, he had received a Bible from somebody. He was not yet a Christian. He received a Bible from somebody, and uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he was a Christian, they gave him a Bible, and he wrote a little note in it that just said, um, Jesus is your great shepherd, and he cares for the sheep. And uh, he hands it to her, and she opens it up, and she reads that verse, and then she knows that that was Jesus in her dream. That was Jesus who, and I'm the sheep, and he picked me up, and I mean, it's as dramatic as that sometimes, it's unbelievable, and, and all of a sudden they realize oh, this is God. And she gave her life to Christ, and eventually her mom, her sister, and that caused them to have to flee because uh, of some situations they had in Iran. And, um, and the, reason I, the reason I tell you this is, well, I'm going to give you one more story, but I mean, 
God is, God is doing things and reaching the world. We oftentimes can get caught up in what's happening in our little parts of the world, which are important, but we can sometimes just forget about that or get discouraged and to realize that when God says to go, it's because he's preparing people to know him and to receive him. One, one more quick uh, story. Um, I don't remember the other daughter's name, um, but the mom is Miriam, and she's the cab driver, and um, this is her daughter, uh, Aida. Uh, and um, she, they both had incredible testimonies. Um, uh, Miriam had an incredible testimony herself, but um, Aida said, said to me, her, her grandfather was really, really high up in Islam and would, um, I guess this was normal, she told me, um, combined a lot of like casting spells and different things with what he believed um, in Islam. And so she was tormented, she said, by spirits and by demons. And she, as a young girl, she was scared to death, scared to death all the time, scared of the dark. And, um, and, and it wasn't just like in her head. She had weird experiences and she didn't want to talk about it because she was just scared. And, um, and she, she didn't know why. And um, one night she had a dream. And all these spirits and demons were doing their thing in, in her dream, and it was really scary. And this man, who she doesn't know who he is, walks up and forces all the demons into this room and shuts the door and locks it. And, um, and then comes back over to her, and she just said, like, oh, I, just, I just knew that he was good. And he started to go back over to the door, and I just started crying and screaming, don't go back over there, don't let them out, they're terrible. And he just looked at her and said, I'm the only one that can take care of those creatures, is the way she translated it. Um, I'm the only one that can take care of those creatures. And she woke up and didn't think much of it. Of course, we know that that was Jesus, and, but she has no idea who Jesus is. And so uh, she, is, she is, I don't know if it was six months or a year later, and she's watching some show on TV, probably on a VPN, and, um, and she, sees, she hears someone say, and I don't know how it's translated properly, but you'll understand, but they said something about that Jesus has come and had victory over the creatures. Whatever it was in her language, it was the same word that she had in her dream, and she knew that it was Jesus. It was 20 years prior. She's telling the story, and she's bawling like it was yesterday because she's like, I have experienced peace and hope and, and have never had the, the, the presence of those spirits since that day uh, after I saw them on TV and knew that was Jesus, and I gave my life to him. Just incredible. So I, I share that. I, I could keep going. I could take up the rest of your morning with stories that are all about that dramatic. My point is, Jesus said to go to go into all the world. Do we realize, and you don't have to go to Iran. Like, there are people that are hungry and are, are wondering who Jesus is that live in our neighborhoods um, that we come in contact with, but they're all over the place, and who knows where God may call you today. So, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm Jesus says to go, and it, this word actually means to journey. I, I like that word even better, journey. And it's this idea to journey, but in the way that it is in the, in the tense of the verb, it means it's assuming that we are going. It's as we are going, as we are journey, journeying, then make disciples, be sharing with what Jesus is doing. Each of you have been given a mission and a purpose, and there are people just like these stories that are hungry. And, um, and, and it's not just halfway across the world, it's all around our lives. Because Acts 17, 26, I shared this sometime, I think earlier this year, from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and boundaries of where they live. God has appointed this time in history, and whether you like it or not, in Adams County for you to live and for you to be a part of this church and what we're doing. And God has placed you here in this moment with a reason, with a purpose, and with a mission. And we need to submit our current appointed time and even boundaries, as it says here, placement by God. We should speak the truth and love to our culture and, and in our relationships, the truth and love always. Not be ashamed of the gospel um, when it comes to the things that we're dealing with in our world and in our nation. But I want us to understand something. It's our job to proclaim God's ways no matter what, but also we, are, we must be people who are listening for God's voice first. And what I mean by this is no matter what happens in this election, or like I said earlier, in the next 10 elections, no matter what happens in our nation, though, though it may go the way we want or at times go the way we don't want it to go, the Great Commission supersedes that. 
And where we happen to live and the condition that it's in, God has a calling for us because this is where we live. And this is what we do. And I think we can forget about that at times, that God has a calling on our lives. And sometimes he has people come into situations because he wants to bring light into the midst of darkness. He wants to bring change into a situation. And, it's, and believe me, we don't put our hope that the ultimate change, the ultimate change of what God wants to do and in the kingdom is gonna happen through elections and through those things. You've heard me talk about this all month. Though those things are important, every single one of those people that I was with this week are praying that their government would change because it makes a big difference. But there's something even for them as we talked about and prayed together, there's something that is behind all of that. Behind all of that for them and behind th that for us, that no matter where we find ourselves, we still have a mission and a calling of God in our lives. And that doesn't change. And sometimes when things get worse, it means that it's getting greater because of what God is calling us to do. And I, I would hope that as, as Americans, if, if we see things that don't go so well, that we don't just think, I, I'm gonna bury my head or I'm just gonna run away from this, but I say to God, God, how do you wanna use me in this place and in this moment? Because this is where you've called me. This is what you're doing in my life. In fact, it's what God told the nation of Israel when they got exiled in Jeremiah 29. He says, he says, when I carried you into exile from Jerusalem into Babylon, where you don't want to be, where it's not great like it was when you were a nation. He says, still though, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not let the dreams you encourage, uh, do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Because everybody was saying, no, 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 we're not gonna be here. God's not gonna let this happen. We're gonna go back to Israel right away. And God said, no, wait a minute. I have you here in this moment for a reason and there's a purpose in it. They're prophesying lies to you in my name, he said, and I have not sent them. He goes on, right? We know that I, I have great plans for you. But God was saying, right now, I have plans to use you in this place of exile. And I, I hope that that is not uh, a picture of where America goes, but if it does, I think the question that we ask ourselves is not, how do we change all of this on the outside or physically? God, what are you saying to me about my life and my going, my journey and for your kingdom with where you have me and where I live right now? I wondered, I mean, let me close with this. I, I wondered, and I don't mean to be insensitive, but it's interesting to hear, and maybe we would almost explain it away as people from a Western culture that obviously have so much more than they do in Iran that, you know, maybe they feel hopeless because, you know, their economy's terrible or their, you know, their, um, their religion doesn't offer them hope. And maybe that's why they're depressed and so many of them seem suicidal. Yet, You've heard us and you know that we've been praying and Manny would tell you one of the number one things that he deals with right now with young people is mental health, depression, and attempts of suicide. And I wonder if it's, you know, not really solved by a better economy or having more money, having an iPhone or having social media accounts or all the great things that we want so bad in our country. But I wonder if it's just as simple as like, man, when people don't understand who God is, and how he's designed them for a purpose, for a kingdom that is greater than any earthly kingdom, that we just get to a place of being hopeless and feeling like, what is, what is the point of all of this anyway? And I just wonder if we're not dealing with the same thing just in a different way in America, that we put so much hope, we put so much stock in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in our lives and in our nation and in a time that is temporary when we're not valuing the things that are more eternal and those things leave us without hope. And I can't help but think of the, the words that Jesus challenges us with, Mark 8, but he does it in, I think, all the Gospels, maybe not John. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That maybe the answer to hopelessness is not thinking of myself more, but actually thinking of myself less. Not that I think bad about myself, but I just am not worried so much about myself, and I'm more worried, Jesus, who are you and what are you doing and what do you want to do with my life? I told you I was going to come back to just this picture as we close. Um, I think it's the next slide. Jacob or Jacob and Erezu. He kept asking me over and over and over again. 
I want to go to, I want to go back to Iran or Turkmenistan or Pakistan or Afghanistan, anywhere where they speak Persian. He goes, I, I, I want to go back there and I, and I want to start churches. And I'm like, man, I will absolutely continue to pray for you. And I'm like, will you pray for me? Would you pray for our churches and for us in America to have the same type of heart and mentality that would just say, I will deny myself and pick up my cross and say, Jesus, where do you want me to go? I want to give my life to you. I want to be said of me, I want to be said of our church, what they said of David when he passed away, King David in Israel. It says, now when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. I don't want to try to bring about my own purposes or other people's purposes or even what I think the purpose of life should be in this moment. I want to know, God, what is your purpose for me right now in this generation? I don't want to try to make it the last generation. I don't want to try to make it the next generation. I just want to know, God, what is your purpose for me in this generation? And so I think it's probably best. Would you, would you stand to your feet with me this morning? And we're, gonna, we're actually going to pray and commission another group that's leaving for a mission trip tonight or tomorrow morning basically the same, late at night. They're heading to Africa. But listen, I think it'll be up on the screen here. Here is Jesus's, one of his final prayers to all of us. So let's just let this sink into us today. Jesus talking to the Father says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy with them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they truly, that they too may be truly sanctified, which is another word for consecrated. Jesus is sending us into the world. He said, I'm not praying that I take you out. Things are going to get bad. Take heart. I have overcome this world. But I'm not, Jesus' prayer for us was not to take us out of every tough situation, but to say, I will be with you when you go. And so I will pray for Jacob and, and as, as a Roo, but I will pray for the same thing for us. God, help us to have the same heart of abandon for you. God, where you want us to go, we will go. and We will do those things for you. Thank you so much for joining us today online. We want to stay connected with you. Be sure to fill out a Connect card. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Foursquare, check out our web or app. We look forward to seeing you each Sunday at 8.30 or 10.30 a.m. Have a blessed week.